This is CBC Here and Now. Basements flooded, uh, properties eroded. Uh, it's just been a, a nightmare for all those of us who live along the river. Residents along Rennie's River in St. John say they've been repeatedly flooded for nearly two decades. And now they say it's high time the city step up. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Debbie Cooper. And I'm Anthony Germain. Flooding. For those who live by the water, it's a recurring nightmare and it's one that's been happening along Rennie's River since 2001. Five years ago, the city committed to a $5 million fix. But as Here and Now's Mark Quinn reports, the water keeps on coming. It's usually a beautiful place for a walk, but when a heavy storm or a hurricane hits, the Rennies River becomes a raging torrent. Not so long ago, it swept a coffin out of a gravesite near Kitty Vitty Lake. David Winter has lived next to the river for many decades, and he's seen a troubling change. Extremely high water almost 10 times since 2001. Basements flooded, uh, properties eroded. Uh, it's just been a, a nightmare for all those of us who live along the river. Here's what Winter's property looks like now. Here's how it looked in 2001, after post-tropical storm Gabrielle dropped 175 millimeters of water. Many think the flooding is the result of development upstream. Subdivisions and malls paving over wetlands that used to absorb water. Others say that's being compounded by climate change, bringing more frequent, powerful storms. A river of cars runs by City Hall. In 2014, consultants were hired here to look at the flooding problem and suggest solutions. Their number one recommendation? Build a dam, or weir, at Long Pond to control water flowing downstream towards properties. Winter says residents along the river like this idea, but they're getting impatient. We're very happy with that recommendation, and uh, uh, to date, uh, little or nothing has been done to see that construction take place. The weir is expected to look something like this structure at the bottom of Kitty Vitty that controls the lake's water level. And Mayor Danny Breen says the city does want to build a weir like this at the east end of Long Pond. You know, we would have uh, preferred to have it completed uh, by this time. But so far, two things have stalled plans to build here. A provincial environmental assessment and the Pippi Park Commission's concerns about impact on walking trails and wildlife habitat. The process is there for, for a reason and we're uh, complying with that and working through it. Residents like Winter hope the city will work through it quickly. Their fear, it's only a matter of time before the next big storm hits. Mark Quinn, CBC News, St. John's. It's a little bit warmer than uh, anticipated this afternoon for the Avalon. Those temperatures jumped up uh, about to about 18 degrees for St. John's. We've got uh, double digit temperatures right across the board and then up through Labrador. Uh, Lab City reached a high near 13 degrees. That was at midnight and those temperatures have since dropped and we can thank uh, a cold front that's moved in for that. Here it is here. It's sweeping across the uh, island as we speak, seeing some clearing skies behind it as well. But those uh, showers are heading towards or already now uh, across the Avalon. We're going to see them move through quite quickly. It looks like after after midnight, things should start to clear out. Tomorrow looks much nicer for some areas, but I'll have all the details coming up. Thanks, Ashley. There's transportation troubles in Torngat. The Liberals have canceled, uh, canceled rather a freight ship that runs between Lewisport and Northern Labrador. But newly elected MHA Leela Evans says Torngat Mountains will pay the price. Trucking in materials means fewer houses being built and more money for supplies, not to mention the impact on food security. The minister responsible says people have the option of shopping out of province, but Evans says that's not the answer. Why should we have to give Quebec that business? Uh, you know, why should we actually put jobs in Quebec when we already have those 30-year relationships, 40-year relationships uh, on the island, given, given the business uh, to our, uh, our fellow Newfoundland and Labradorians? Our premier actually is the Minister of uh, Labrador Affairs. 
So it is actually creating hardship for, for our Inuit population and our Inuit population in Napishish. And he is also Minister of Indigenous Affairs. We'll have more of Anthony's conversation with MHA Leela Evans ahead on Here and Now. But staying with provincial politics, Premier Dwight Ball says he'll be able to make an announcement on the replacement of the Cornerbrook Hospital pretty soon. It's a promise that was first made by Danny Williams in 2007, and Ball says he'll move ahead with it, but there's already a fight brewing about who is going to build it. Here now's Katie Breen is in our newsroom with all the details. So Katie, what's happening? Well, tradespeople in the province and on the West Coast, they want to be hired on site. Construction of the hospital is expected to take years, and people who have to fly in and out of the area for work, well, they want to stay home and do the job. But Premier... Of course, what we want to see is, is people from Newfoundland and Labrador, people, local people, find jobs. But, you know, these, uh, as I mentioned today, is when you look at local people, we have uh, some large companies that operate on the West Coast that actually do business all around this province. So we need to be very careful if when we ring fence where people can actually in the work and the work that they, and projects that they can work on. So Ball's saying if you start imposing rules like that, companies will only be able to apply for jobs in their neck of the woods and that'll limit business. But independent MHA Eddie Joyce says it's the workers who want the guarantee. Last summer, tradespeople from PEI were brought into Cornerbrook to help build a long-term care facility. And Joyce says workers want a guarantee from the Premier that something like that isn't going to happen again. When you got a chance to, to have three or 400 local people off from Western Newfoundland, uh, to uh, work in their own communities, be with their own families, and him not even try to give an answer, a reasonable answer, even say, okay, we'll work to see what we could do. I found it very demeaning and dismissive. Joyce brought up this issue today after question period, but under a new rule, independent MHAs will get to ask a question every Wednesday. So now Joyce can bring up this issue and any others he may have on a weekly basis. Live in the newsroom, I'm Katie Breen for Here and Now. There's a hole in the family. I mean, he was always the jokester. A year since his disappearance. Christmas, birthdays, no sign of Trevor Hamlin, affectionately known as Pepsi. A family's resolve. That's coming up. The St. John's Farmer's Market is upgrading its security systems following a robbery yesterday. Somebody broke in through a kitchen window and stole cash from the market's ATM. But the missing cash is the least of the pain this incident has caused. Here are now Zach Gowdy spoke with Farmer's Market Executive Director Pam Anstey. So early in the morning, um, someone came in, bashed in a window. They broke into one of our ATMs. We certainly have no full details on exactly what they got away with at this point in time, but they did certainly break into the ATM. It is really sad. It's really unfortunate that someone would take it upon themselves to steal from a nonprofit organization and one that supports so many small businesses and small entrepreneurs. So that's the really unfortunate part of it all. When someone breaks into a nonprofit organization, it's not just what's taken. It's kind of the aftermath of everything, right? It's the cleanup, it's the mess, it's the repair jobs, it's things like that. There's a lot of things that go into us picking up the pieces afterwards and making sure that everything is back up and running again. So we are a market that runs all throughout the week. So shutting down our kitchen even for a couple of days makes a great deal of difference. Now this break-in is not going to affect activities at the market. It's hosting an international bazaar this evening and the kitchen is going to be back up and running in time for the farmer's market this weekend. More trouble for a Mount Pearl businessman, with some questioning whether or not his business is even real. A few weeks back, we told you about Philip Chancy. He was facing allegations from an investor who said he was defrauded. We've since learned of more allegations and more lawsuits. Here and now's Ryan Cook has that story. This is Philip Chancy. He lives in a quaint Mount Pearl home. According to former partners, he seems like a legitimate businessman. But there's three separate lawsuits now with very similar allegations. Each of them question whether or not Chansey's business pursuits were real in the first place. There's two large multinational companies and one local group, Hickman Motors. Hickman says Chansey came to them with a deal. He could get them 304 cars repossessed in the United States if they could put up a $400,000 deposit. That was in November. 
Last month, we told you about Jerome Groves. He said Chansey ripped him off by getting him to invest in an electric vehicle dealership, a dealership that still doesn't exist. The day after that story aired, Hickman Motors started asking Chansey for proof that their money was used to purchase those 300 cars. On May 29th, Hickman sued Chansey and questioned if the cars ever existed. So let's rewind for a second. Before we ever met Jerome Groves, there was a lawsuit in Nova Scotia where hundreds of pages of court documents lay out the case made by an auction house, Alex Lyon and Son, against Philip Chansey. It was over a few hundred pieces of heavy equipment that were said to be seized in Texas. When there was no movement on the deal, the auction house began to wonder if the deal was even real. That lawsuit was settled in the winter when Chansey gave them their $600,000 back. But two days before he made that payment, he received a million dollars from a different company. Cox Automotive is now suing to get their million dollars back, with lawyers saying the money is in a foreign bank account. When we asked Chansey for comment on the last story, he gave us a lengthy written response. But for this story, we got a flat rejection. He's yet to file a defense in court for the Hickman Motors matter, but he is due to appear in Supreme Court on Monday for the Cox Automotive case. Ryan Cook, CBC News, St. John's. For the first time ever, the flag of the Philippines is flying outside the town hall in Happy Valley Goose Bay. It's all to mark Independence Day in the Philippines. And with 300 Filipinos in that community and counting, there was a lot to celebrate. Here now is Jacob Barker was there. Filipinos, come on, stop. I, Wilson Wally Anderson, mayor of Happy Valley Goose Bay, declared June the 12th Filipino Day and the month of June as Filipino Heritage Month in the town of Happy Valley Goose Bay. I think it was uh, really cool. That I'm Filipino myself, so I uh, hold a lot of pride into that, that as well. Seeing your flag flying and hearing your national anthem sung here in, in Goose Bay, uh, what's that like? It's really interesting. Uh, I've never uh, been at an event like this before in uh, uniform, so uh, it's a great honor. Every special occasion, we always have noodles because we believe noodles is for long-lasting life. When I arrived here nine years ago, there's nothing here that we can find to, to make food, to make our comfort food. But now that we're, the Philippines are getting bigger, it's more convenient for us now to go in the store and get all the ingredients that we need. And it was awesome. You've probably seen the community grow a lot over yes, the years. Yes, I do. From before we started here, like we can only count in our finger. And now I can even, I, I didn't know that we are over 300 people. It's overwhelming and I'm so glad I'm part of it. Why is it good to be a part of something like this? Because it's like you feel like home, all the Filipinos, even, even if we have different dialects or upbringing we are all in one right here, right now i've been here four years and now i'm doing university in st john's and there's also a growing number of filipinos there so it's really nice to um, see that newfoundland is like uh, the whole of newfoundland is embracing this culture having this is the feeling of uh, inclusion in the community I i've been wanting this for uh, since I came here, like, we should be united, celebrate our uh, culture, like, Canada is very welcoming with different immigrants from different countries, so why not celebrate it?
this point, no one involved in the police investigation will give a reason for the collapse of the roof. But it's natural for people to speculate that heavy snow from yesterday's storm was the culprit. Structural engineers have been called in and ultimately they'll be the ones to determine the cause. Is the Canadian campaign getting through to them? Well, if uh, you're right, I, I guess it's, uh, it can't be getting through to them yet. And they, the Spanish and the Portuguese say they might even have to do more of that if the campaign against them keeps up. Well, we're going to keep, the, the campaign against them is going to keep up. They're uh, violating every environmental rule in connection with the fishery. Okay, we're going to have a little fun here now. It's going to race against Debbie Cooper from CBC. <laughs> Joseph, I'm no champion. You certainly are. <laughs> wow. Oh Pretty good my. speed there, Debbie. Yes, I'm fearless. <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> and reckless on a sled, it yeah. seems, once the competition was underway. Oh, my goodness. I'd yeah. forgotten some of the earlier ones. That one at the Village Mall. Mm -hmm. That must be uh, well, early 80s, somewhere right. in there. And I was on crutches. Oh, no. <laughs> Yeah, but they sent me out to do the story. Oh, of course they did. Yeah. <laughs> Junior reporter. It's probably the weight of those shoulder pads that caused some problems with your legs, right? <laughs> Give her some crutches. Oh my, so I'm funny. supposed to be rolling this. Oh, yeah. Aha, we have some other video that'll okay. interest you. A bit of tension. Yeah, a um, <laughs> bit of a wildlife video near Happy Valley Goose Bay that captures a, a kind of a David and Goliath moment. Oh my, this scrappy little mama fox took on a black bear. And this is what happened when the bear got a little too close to her kits. Yes. Don't they, mess with the fox. No. Oh my. It's wow. amazing, isn't it? Yeah, thanks yeah. to Flora Elson for uh, this video. What a bark on that one. <laughs> <laughs> right on cue. <laughs> I hope the bear figured, might as well leave. Yeah. It's not worth it. That's, I've never a, actually heard a fox. Me either. So, you remember that song, What Does a Fox Say? Yeah, that, apparently that's what it is, Yeah, right? and there you yeah. go. <laughs> that answered my question. Oh, it was <gasps> there. Oh. That's quite the bark, though. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Oh, our producer is telling us he wanders off. Yeah. The bear does. Oh, okay. Well, there you go. Good. Perfect. Good All to right. know. <laughs> so, we have this uh, weather coming in overnight, at least in our neck of the woods. Yeah, already here. We're seeing some showers already outside. Uh, temperatures, I don't know if you got out earlier this afternoon, but warm. they bumped right yeah. up. Yeah, around noon I was outside and I was like, oh, wow, this is a lot warmer than I expected, but welcome for sure. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Warmer so, than you expected? Yeah, I only expected a high near 15 today, oh. so there you go. So, that's the way you say you were wrong? or Yes. Okay. <laughs> It's okay. Wouldn't you, rather me, wouldn't you rather me be, it be warmer than cooler yes, than yes. expected? Yes, <laughs> yes. I'm so glad she was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take a look at those temperatures again uh, this afternoon. 18 degrees here in St. John's, as I just mentioned. 15 in Stephenville. And then Lab City hit that 13 degree mark, but that was at midnight. If we take a look at those temperatures now, hovering around the 6 degree mark. So quite significant, about 21 degrees less than what it was yesterday at this time. And then Happy Valley Goose Bay at 9 degrees. And then we still have those double digit temperatures across uh, the island. Now we can see that southerly flow and we talked about that yesterday. We're going to start to see some warmer air move in again uh, in the upper levels. So that means those temperatures are going to bump up as we head into Friday and even into Saturday that sticks around. So that's certainly good news uh, for that. But you can see that low spinning uh, counterclockwise here in that cold front sweeping across the island. That's bringing some showers. It's moving quite quickly though. So with some clearing skies in behind that, that will continue to do so. It looks like after midnight everything should be said and done uh, for most of the island except some lingering shower activity essentially from Corner Brook northward up through the Great Northern Peninsula and then we're going to stick around with that uh, cloud cover and shower activity again for uh, western portions or rather central and eastern portions of Labrador. Lab City should clear out nicely tonight. And then that low moves offshore, which means we get back into that onshore flow. So the potential for some uh, drizzle will continue through tomorrow afternoon. So here's a look at your uh, temperatures overnight, dipping into the mid single digits for the most part. Again, that lingering uh, shower activity possible for Corner Brook, Port of Basque, 8 degrees. Westerly is generally between 20 and 30 kilometers per hour. Those winds uh, for the east 
eastern portion of the island will be around southwesterlies between 40 and 60 kilometers per hour. So it's going to stay quite gusty overnight tonight. Eventually, we will see some clearing skies. And then up through Labrador, zero degrees for Lab City tonight. Could see some patchy frost with that, or likely we'll see some patchy frost with that. With those clear skies, those winds light as well. And then shower activity from Happy Valley Goose Bay all the way through to the coast with northwesterlies. Again, with that, we could see some uh, patchy fog as well. So there goes that low, but uh, plenty of cloud cover expected along the northeast coast tomorrow. Same for southeastern Labrador. Otherwise, in behind that, some clearing skies with some sun and cloud. And I mentioned those temperatures are going to be much warmer as well. So if we take a look at those temperatures, we should be hovering uh, in the mid to high teens. 17 degrees for St. John's. Uh, slight chance of some afternoon showers, but should see, should see the sun quite, uh, quite a lot tomorrow. Marystown, 19 degrees. Keeping that cloud cover and shower activity up. Up along the northeast coast, 8 degrees for Twillingate, 16 for Grand Falls, Windsor. Uh, warmest will be down around Bergio and uh, Port of Basque at 18 degrees, Corner Brook 17, and then as we head towards the northern peninsula, still going to hang on to that potential for some showers. 11 for St. Anthony with those northerly winds. Again, some patchy fog possible and some drizzle. 20 degrees, we're back there again for Lab City and Happy Valley Goose Bay, but still looking at that slight chance of showers. So let's look at your forecast. We'll look ahead towards the weekend when I come back. Thanks, Ashley. Now back to one of our top stories tonight. The MHA for Torngat Mountain says the Premier needs to weigh in on an issue that is hurting people in Labrador. Leela Evans says the suspension of freight service from Lewisport to the North Coast means high prices for building supplies, and that affects housing for Indigenous people. And she says the big land can bank on even higher prices for food. And she says Ball chose to personally handle Cabinet responsibilities for Labrador affairs as well as Indigenous people and he should act. I spoke with her earlier today. I'm going to talk about transportation issues with a new MHA for a Torngat Mountain. So, uh, Leela Evans, what is the issue of what's been cancelled between Lewisport and the North Coast with respect to housing supplies? Well, the Liberal government actually cancelled the freight boat from uh, Lewisport to my district at Torngat Mountains. And now they have to truck all the materials up uh, to Goose Bay, which is a, a huge cost for trucking and also extra cost for logistics. So all the, uh, all the building materials are going to go up in price. Looking at, let us say, example, Torngat Housing is an organization that builds houses and makes repairs for Inuit, the Inuit population in my district. And most of their, their clientele is people on low income or with large families. So there's going to be less houses built and there's going to be less repairs because of the additional costs. So it's going to impact them greatly. Right, so fewer houses plus those houses that are built are going to be more expensive? It's going to be much more expensive. Okay, so that's building supplies and its impact on housing. What concerns do you have about what we all need, food? Food security is a big issue on, uh, on the North Coast because of the increased costs of actually getting materials into the North Coast because there's no roads. All the food. Um, supplies that the stores actually sell on the north coast and that people buy in bulk comes from the island because it's, it's cheaper. So now everybody's going to have to find a way to get all that food supplies trucked up to Goose Bay and then put on the boat. And that extra cost is actually going to cause a lot of hardship because the stores, because of the extra cost, is going to have to increase their prices. And people who are trying to buy in bulk so they can cut down on their food costs over the winter, they're not going to be able to do that. Now one last question for you. The minister responsible says that people have the option of having things trucked up from Quebec. Does this policy uh, put certain stores and businesses on the island of Newfoundland at a disadvantage? Because if you buy things from Quebec, maybe they're cheaper, but then the businesses here don't make the sales. Well, when they were told that in the meetings, the people in my district, the communities in the town halls, they were actually shocked because they were saying, why should we have to go to Quebec? Why should we have to give Quebec that business? Uh, you know, why should we actually put jobs in Quebec when we already have those 30-year relationships, 40-year relationships uh, on the island, given, given the business uh, to our, uh, our fellow Newfoundland and Labradorians? But I will also say, too, is it, 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 it was shocking that the, it would come from the Liberal government because the, the, our Premier actually is the Minister of uh, Labrador Affairs. So he's actually creating hardship for, for our Inuit population and our Inuit population in Napishish. And he's also Minister of Indigenous Affairs. So regardless of 
uh, you know, like what, how it's going to affect the island uh, and, and, and the province, we got to look at our people because our people are the most vulnerable. Right. We are already dealing with very, very high prices. All right, uh, Ms. Evans, appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now, for his part, the Premier says he is aware of the concerns and he is keeping his eyes on them. I have spoke to many of the suppliers that actually supply goods to the North Coast, and they are, are telling me that, you know, they'll find a way to make sure that this freight gets delivered to Appy Valley Goose Bay. So we'll be monitoring this. I made that commitment to the President yesterday to make sure that this is not seen as increasing costs. Welcome back to Here and Now. This week, the Hamlin family is marking a sad one-year anniversary. Last June, Trevor Hamlin went missing without a trace. Police say he was last seen in the Paradise neighborhood where he lived. 
Hamlin's sister Ashley believes someone knows something and she's determined to help her family find closure. The CBC's Chrissy Holmes met with Ashley Hamlin in the very place her brother disappeared. Yeah, these are almost a year old and as you can tell the weather kind of soaked them and tore them apart. Yeah, these are laminated so that way to help with the weather. How did he get the nickname Pepsi? <laughs> Our father actually works with the Pepsi company, Brownie Harvey. So he would always bring home or bring to school two or three bottles of Pepsi. <laughs> so all of his friends always nicknamed him Pepsi. I remember once my mom yelled out to his friends downstairs and was like, Trevor, come upstairs. And they're like, who's Trevor? They didn't even know his actual name because all his friends had nicknames. <laughs> that was the high school thing. And it's just something that never left him. So where, where was he last seen? He was last seen at home, which is actually right here. This is his house, around 3.30. Still no sign of him, and we still don't know where he's to. There's been no new tips or anything like that. So the police still don't know how he left the home, exactly what time, who, if anyone was with him. We're still at stage one in that regards. But it's still a very active and open investigation, and the police are still working their case. How has this been for you and your family? No answers, no nothing, just up and gone. It's devastating. I mean, we have our good days and we have our bad days. Unfortunately, the bad days are really bad. Holidays and that is definitely the hardest. I mean, we didn't want to celebrate Christmas. My son, he is constantly, let's every holiday, let's do a party, let's celebrate. He's never once asked though, what has happened on Go Trevor? And I'm actually petrified for the day that that comes. And he asks his mommy, where's Uncle Trevor? How come he hasn't been around? Because I don't have no answers to give him. So how do you move on? His birthday was only last month. And that was the hardest for all of us. May 2-4 was his favorite holiday. He loved to go up in the woods, you know, have some beer. He was a true Newfoundlander in that aspect. And the fact that his birthday was May 2-4, like, it matched his personality perfectly. He didn't care about his birthday, he just cared about the holiday <laughs> and spending it with his friends. It's a small community. Um, have you been hearing things or do people tell you things? No, I mean, obviously they say that they're thinking about us and we appreciate that. But since he went missing, I mean, we've learned some things that we never knew about Trev until he went missing because people would tell us. I mean, that's how we found out that, unfortunately, Trevor got involved with some things that he wasn't supposed to with a bad group of people. I don't exactly know what happened. I don't know what he was involved with, but I do feel like it is connected to his disappearance. And I do feel like he's murdered, that he will not be coming back to us. I'm kind of at the point now that we trust no one. As much as I love Trevor's friends in that, you know, I'm always going to have that doubt until we have the answers about Trevor, who was involved, what happened. That's the biggest question. You don't know who is involved and you don't know who you could trust outside your immediate family. And that's how it is. How do your parents feel about you out here doing this today? My mother is very happy about it. I mean, She's happy that we're keeping his face out there, that we're keeping the information out there, that we're letting people know that we're not going to stop, that we're still looking for him, that we still don't have the answers. And she respects that. I mean, she's not comfortable coming out because this is very emotional for her. As you can imagine, her child went missing. So if this is what I could do to give her a little bit of peace and comfort, I'm going to do it. We're always going to be looking for him. We're, if someone gives us a new tip, we're going to follow up on it. We're never going to give up until we have that closure for our family. To the Muskrat Falls Inquiry now, former Nalcor CEO Ed Martin was challenged about failing to tell the government about rising costs before everything was finalized. Now, looking back at previous testimony, Inquiry co-counsel asked Martin if Nalcor could have given the government a chance to cancel the project. Martin says the job was to give the government a thoroughly researched package and a note, this exchange you're about to see, this has been edited for time. Pardon? Do you have another question or did you want me to finish my, my point? 
Well, I'm, I'm, I'm just saying to you that you're talking about preparing documents and how much time it takes and so on. These documents were already prepared. It wouldn't have taken any additional effort to supply them to government. Um, so let me lead off from that, and go, but to go back to where I was to try to explain that before you um, ask, the, ask the next question. Um, as I said, uh, it takes a huge amount of work to put these, this information together. And what I'm talking about was the initial point you made. You said it took three to four months or three months to go from there to there. That's exactly what I was saying. In addition, in addition to the politicians and civil servants that I referred to, even Ken Marshall of the Board of Directors said that it should have been provided to the Board of Directors and it wasn't. So what do you make of that, that you're the only person of all these witnesses who holds to the view or holds the view that there was no obligation in terms of transparency and disclosure to provide the July 2013 final forecast cost report to government. Is that your question? Well, does that concern you that you're the only one? A um, couple of points again. Well, does it concern you? Uh, I'm trying, I, I th um, I'm, I'm about to answer that. Okay, go ahead. Um, so a couple of points again. Uh, the first point is, um, I think I heard, I did hear Mr. Marshall's testimony on this, and um, I felt Mr. Testi or Mr. Marshall's testimony or it read more like, um, yeah, he, may, he would have liked to have seen it, but he understood that he would not want to see it unless it was vetted. I think the words he used was stressed. Welcome back to Here and Now. Blowing up bombs for new energy, a Newfoundland undersea imaging company is helping clean up some dangerous remnants of the past in some other parts of the world. As Here and Now, Sarah Snelly reports, they're cleaning up history to make way for the future. This wasn't the kind of boom Moya Cal imagined she'd be working with when she launched Pangeo Subsea, an underwater imaging company, in 2006 at the peak of the province's offshore oil boom. But when that boom went bust, Pangeo found new business, finding unexploded bombs and mines strewn on the bottom of the North and Baltic seas so they can be dug up and safely detonated, like this mine they found for the Danish Navy. 
During World War II, there were over 50 million bombs that were dropped between the UK and Europe. And so the Danish Navy, of course, know there's a lot of munition sites uh, in and around their coastline. So uh, they, they went offshore with us uh, just a couple of months ago, and we, we actually identified some really significant mines for them. When we go and look for a bomb, we work with experts who are historians and um, you know, people who have done a lot of work in the Navy and seen these things and dug them up. Uh, so they look at the historical records to know what's likely to have been dropped there. So they, they look at the records of the bombing runs and they look, because the Germans took, kept excellent records of where they left all their mines and their bombs. And uh, so they look at those records and they say, yeah, in this area you're going to find this type of bomb, which is, you know, so large, and then we know what to look for. There's a lot of interest in offshore wind energy in the North and Baltic Seas. And often, Pangeo is finding bombs so they can be cleared to make way for wind farms. It balances out the other energy sectors, our hydroelectric as well as our oil and gas se sector. So yes, I'm quite confident that uh, with time, it'll, we will see offshore wind farms here off the, off the coast of Newfoundland. Cal hopes her team will be doing work for wind energy in their home province someday too. Turning now to national news, two University of New Brunswick students kidnapped in Ghana more than a week ago have been rescued during an armed raid. They have been in contact with the Canadian authorities and are undergoing the necessary evaluations following a traumatic incident like this. Preliminary indications that we have is that they are fine. Lauren Tilly and Bailey Chitty were in Ghana working for Youth Challenge International. They were taken at a golf club in the south of the country. Shots were fired in today's raid. Tilly and Chitty were not hurt, but one of the eight suspects was. The pair is reportedly receiving emotional and psychological support as they travel home. In international news, Hong Kong police used pepper spray, tear gas and rubber bullets to hold back a group of umbrella-waving protesters today. Now, authorities say at least seven people were sent to hospital in this, and some of the demonstrators tried to storm the territory's legislature to prevent debate of a proposed extradition bill. Now, that law would let China bring Hong Kong residents to the mainland to face trial in the Chinese court system. And many observers see this as an attempt to silence opposition in Hong Kong and threaten Hong Kong's freedoms.
had some fun questions come my way. Where is the iceberg that sank the Titanic, for instance? Uh, I've, had, I've had this asked. I've had people ask me, why do icebergs not melt in salt water? And uh, these are questions, of course, that don't have an answer. Hi, I am Stephen Bruno. I'm a professor at Memorial University of Newfoundland. I'm here to talk about icebergs. If we were to look offshore and see um, one of these icebergs, it's been afloat for, for two years from uh, probably uh, Ilulisat uh, Ice Fjord, which is the most productive glacier in, in Greenland, where more than 30 cubic kilometers of ice calve off every year and uh, a cubic kilometer is, uh, is a lot. If you look at an iceberg, if, if that iceberg has, has not moved for a while, it's probably grounded, and it's probably grounded in water that is about the same depth as that berg is wide. So the depth of the iceberg is about the width of the iceberg. Now, some would think this is not quite right because we know that about 90% of the ice is below. That's 90% of the volume of the ice. It doesn't mean that it's nine times bigger below in terms of width and depth and everything. That would make the percentage very different. What we have is an iceberg with a waterline length of so much and its depth is probably about the same. If you think about that and you look at the icebergs that are offshore, you can then sort of get a sense of, of how deep the ocean is at that point and perhaps peel away the water's layer and see this prodigiously huge chunk of ice. That's fantastic. It is fantastic. It doesn't even take away any of the magic once we know all this no, information yeah, no, exactly. of looking at the icebergs. But if anything, it makes it cooler. And you kept saying, oh, that's cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was neat, like how deep it is wide. Mm -hmm. That's neat uh, yeah. to think about that. I have a strange desire to play whack-a-mole all of a sudden. <laughs> yeah. yeah. wow. Thanks for doing that, yeah. Stephen that Bruno. That was wonderful. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's move along to... Yeah, news. yeah, we're going to go into Friday's forecast. Uh, so once we get through the rain tonight, actually Thursday looks pretty nice, and then uh, into Friday, not too bad either. So we'll take a look at that, the okay. future tracker. Uh, should see some clearing skies, might see some more cloud cover along the northeast coast, and then eventually some of that cloud cover will move in through the day, but still anticipating we'll see some peaks of sun. Best chance to see some rain will be for Lab West, and then we'll eventually uh, see some rain move in by the early morning hours as this next system weak disturbance moves through and keeps us a little bit unsettled through the weekend. So here's a look at the temperatures. Warmer for some areas, especially along the west coast, 21 degrees in Cornerbrook, Port of Basque sitting at 14 degrees for your Friday. Marystown 16 with plenty of sunshine and then still have that chance to showers in for uh, St. John's, a little cooler, only reaching a high near 11 degrees at this point. Uh, 18 up through Happy Valley Goose Bay, and then Lab City sitting at 16 degrees again with that chance of showers. A little cooler up through Nain and 7, and then plenty of sunshine it looks like for Gander. You should reach a high near 15 degrees for your uh, start of the weekend. So here's a look at Saturday morning. There's that to potential for some showers. We are in that southerly flow, but then northeasterly or at least north onshore along the northeast coast uh, to start off Saturday morning. So it does look like things should stay cloudy, and then we'll see that shower activity spread across the island through the day into Sunday morning as well. Another round of rain will move in for western portions of Labrador, and then we could see some peaks of sun through the day on Saturday, or rather Sunday, and then into Monday that uh, low will continue to track a little bit further along the coast with more showers for the southwest. So it doesn't look like we'll see too much in the way of sunshine, but at least a few peaks over the next couple of days into Monday evening, that shower activity will move back in. So here's a look at the next five days. Uh, 17 tomorrow, a little cooler to uh, start out the weekend. Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, again, have uh, some sunshine in there. More cloud than sun on Sunday, but between 12 and 13 degrees Monday is when we'll see that chance of showers move in for uh, St. John's, it looks like. For uh, central Newfoundland, 16 to 18 degrees uh, to finish off the work week. Saturday and Sunday look okay as far as that cloud cover goes. Again, cloudy periods, uh, 19 degrees by Sunday and Monday. That return of that uh, potential for some showers 
Western Newfoundland, similar uh, forecast. Monday or Friday looks mostly cloudy and then rain possible for both Saturday and Sunday with those temperatures in the teens. So dipping a little bit for Eastern Labrador, 19 degrees tomorrow, 18 for your Friday. And then into Saturday, we're looking at that potential for some showers. The end of the week looks cloudy, or weekend rather, but 16 degrees. And then for Western Labrador, 20 degrees again tomorrow. Well, a little bit of a roller coaster as we head into the beginning of next week, but it does look gray. So let's look at your forecast. I'll have your weather photo in a little bit. Thanks, Ashley. Well, this time of year, we're turning our attention to the garden. Summer nights will soon be spent with any luck with an outdoor fire with any luck tonight on the lowdown that's our consumer news you can use series our jen white got some tips to protect you and your property the weather's warming up and that means it's time to buy or break out the fireplace for your yard but the st john's regional fire department says it's important to follow the rules to keep the flames contained here's the lowdown on outdoor fireplace safety According to the rules in St. John's, when setting up an outdoor fireplace, it needs to be at least 3 meters or 10 feet away from anything that can catch fire, like your house, a shed, any fences, and overhanging trees or wires. The fireplace has to be on a non-combustible base that extends at least 18 inches beyond the circumference of the fireplace. It also needs to have a screen or spark arrestor to keep the fire contained. Make sure that you're only burning seasoned wood, so we don't want to put any pressure treated wood or any garbage, things like that in there. Only burn if winds are less than 25 kilometers an hour. And we want to make sure that you have a garden hose with you or a bucket of water or a fire extinguisher so you can put the fire out before you're leaving it for the evening. We want to make sure that it's out completely. And it's important to remember that not everyone may enjoy the outdoor fireplace as much as you do. If your neighbor is annoyed by the smoke from your outdoor fireplace, then they are within their rights to call and complain about that. We have to remember that some people have respiratory problems, and even though it might be nice and enjoyable for you, not everybody enjoys the smell of wood smoke. Party says it's crucial to keep safety top of mind. If you don't follow the safety rules, things can get pretty bad in a hurry, especially if the grass in your yard is dry or the trees or brush around it is dry. The last thing we would want would be for some of the embers to come out of the fireplace, catch the grass on fire or the trees or your home or your shed. Other municipalities may have different regulations, so be sure to check with your own municipality to find out what their regulations are so you can be as safe as you can while enjoying your outdoor fireplace. Well, something uh, mm. to enjoy while you're out with your fireplace is the sunset. Beautiful sunset uh, captured here. I love the colors. Any idea where that's taken? Where's that hill or mountain behind there, <laughs> Anthony? Any <laughs> guess? No idea. I got nothing. Me All right. either. I'll tell you where this photo was taken and who sent it in when we come back.
Welcome back. We've been asking viewers to send in their favorite moments and memories of Debbie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so here's a cute story from Maria May on Twitter who writes, When my nephew was a toddler, he would only eat while <laughs> Debbie was talking. And so his mom has to record the news so that he would eat three times a day, really. So there you go, Debbie. Wow. You actually help someone get fed. <laughs> Uh, we also got a bunch of photos from you over the years from our very popular open house events. There's a nice one. Yeah, this photo is from Nadine Wells of her young son, Romeo. He met Debbie in 2010 when he was just about two years old. How yeah, adorable. Very cute. And uh, Chris LeDrew sent this picture of his daughter, Emily. And that guy who was on last night was actually there <laughs> as well, Jonathan. And this is Ashley Shepard meeting Debbie at an open house as well. The mm -hmm. same one that uh, Romeo was oh, at. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. right. Oh, there yeah. you go. And we have this from Karen and Stephen Reed who met Debbie back in uh, 2014. Yeah, and more of a recent photo. This is from Rod and Billie Jean Colburn from mm -hmm. Gander, who got a tour of the CBC when they were here in St. John's for an appointment earlier this year. So thanks so much for sharing. Yeah, great. Thanks for sharing, and thanks. Uh, it was great to meet everybody like mm -hmm. that. Those open houses were amazing. 2,000 people would come I through. Know. Wow. <laughs> they were really quite the event. <laughs> yes. That's awesome. Yeah. Oh, well, we've got another uh, little bit of a photo there That's to share with super. you. Beautiful pink sky there. This photo was taken it's in the Big Land. Uh, yeah. yeah, up through uh, or up in Cartwright. I got a bunch of photos actually from how beautiful the sunset was last night. So mm -hmm. I have a, a few more to share with you probably over the week. But, all from uh, Labrador? All from Labrador, yeah. So Shirley Walsh captured this one. Thank you so much for sending that photo in. And if you have any that you'd like to share with us, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. Yes. Thank you for reminding us in the east that there's a sun. <laughs> We're going to see that. some tomorrow, though. Yes. Right. Yep. More than likely, we'll Good. see some sun. Glass half We're, full, Anthony. That's true. right. That's true. I dropped the glass. <laughs> Have a great night. Thanks for being with us. See you tomorrow. Good night.